Welcome back to the Net Zero Carbon Summit at FreightWaves. I'm Alan Adler, the FreightWaves Bureau Chief in Detroit. I'm joined today by Hugh Donnell, who is the representative for Cummins Incorporated at the Cummins Westport Natural Gas Joint Venture. Hugh, it's great to have you with us today. I hope we have a great conversation. Thank you, Alan. Looking forward to it. Yeah, you know, you your area fits perfectly into what we're talking about today because we're going to talk about renewable natural gas. We're going to talk about uh, engines, which, of course, Cummins is best known for, although you're certainly uh, the company is certainly moving into into some new power areas. And, and we've been uh, talking about that over time as well. But, you know, I wanted to get just a good understanding, if we could, of the Cummins Westport relationship and your role there. Well, thank you very much, Alan. So, yeah, I'm uh, business growth and development for the joint venture, which is a sort of a subgroup that uh, focuses strictly on uh, natural gas engines from um, 6.7 liter to uh, 12 liter. And uh, we make those products all available throughout North America. And frankly, we've got the product uh, that goes overseas as well. So it is a technology that is uh, with operating, with, operated with renewable natural gas. We are able to achieve a, a net sub-zero emissions on our engine, which is very appealing to parts of the country or parts of the world where uh, air quality is a real big issue. Yeah, so natural gas, before we talk about renewable natural gas, natural gas has always sort of had a, a place, at least for the last you know 20 years anyway, a place in trucking. Um, it, it comes and it goes. It, it, you know, there are people like uh, ACT Research that track it and things like that, but it, it doesn't seem to hold to any particular pattern. Um, where does natural gas sort of fit in that kind of pantheon, if you will, of engine choices? Well, natural gas engines uh, actually made the shift. Uh, we've been building them since 1986 in a variety of different applications. We've seen them in propane applications or renewable natural gas or natural gas applications. And for the most part, the primary um, driver was fuel cost. It's a lot lower than diesel. It has... Um, doesn't have the volatility and pricing that diesel fuel does. So that's why you appeal to some fleets. And then some fleets who are actually delivering natural gas would want to use that in their engines as well. So there's sort of a, a small marketing opportunity that kind of shifted Alan in about 19, uh, well, actually in about uh, 2018, uh, the emphasis on um, the emissions became very important and, and not just for any one specific technology, but for uh, the objectives of this country and to get our engines down to zero or sub-zero emissions, the Paris Accord, everything kind of sort of merged in 2018. We released our product at 0.02 gram NOx, which is 90% cleaner than a diesel engine. That's very important. Uh, and then when you put in renewable natural gas on top of it, you have a sub, uh, net sub-zero emissions on our engine. So now the primary driver is lower emissions. Lower cost of operations because the fuel costs are lower, and and that's what appeals to a lot more private fleets now. So as you start looking at companies who have some greenhouse gas liabilities, they can start relieving some of those liabilities by moving their goods to the market using our engines. So the it sounds from what you're saying that that, that a lot of people might be missing a great opportunity um, by staying with you know diesel, but I think what you've described to me is a a thing where this works really well for like uh, uh, less than truckload and return to base operations and things like that. Not necessarily long haul at this point. Can you explain that a little? Yeah. So the engine that we have available is a 6.7 liter engine, uh, which predominantly is a, an application below 33,000 GBW. Then we have a nine liter engine and the nine liter is up to 66,000 GBW. And the nine is predominantly used in bus and transit operations or waste refuse application. So again, that nine liters is probably our biggest volume uh, engine at this point. And then uh, five years ago, we released the 12 liter engine or 11, nine liter engine. That engine is predominantly um, class eight. Uh, again, LTL uh, applications, return to base operations, but that's up to 80,000 pounds GBW. And that's how they all three break out. So, so you can get all the way up to a, a true Real and not a baby eight like a sixty-six thousand might be, but a, a full eight uh, with natural gas. And uh, 
So, so who then, you know, especially in the time that, that you've been working, the 10 years you've been with uh, the Westport uh, joint venture, who are the main uh, customers, so the, the, the groups, not the names necessarily? Well, um, as I said a little bit earlier, on the, on the 12 leaders, predominantly LTL carriers, it is um, private fleets, uh, it might be grocery companies, it might be um, uh, fuel haulers, we even have fuel haulers running uh, um, product with our, our engines. Um, but again, I think the biggest players are the LTL carriers, the national LTL carriers that are going to the 12 liter engine. That is a, a very popular one. And then on the nine liter, largely around refuse and transit bus operations. And then the six, seven is going to be straight trucks, delivery trucks. And again, most all of these applications are operating in urban applications where you have high uh, sensitivity around air quality in these uh, larger communities. So it sort of targets then uh, those applications target uh, a more urban application. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we talk about California, which we you can't talk about any of these things without talking about California. Uh, you talk about California, you talk about disadvantaged communities, uh, you know, near the ports and things like that. Um, the, the real push, though, seems to be toward electricity. Now, we both know that it's not as great as it sounds in some ways, but I, I think you're going to make the case here, perhaps, that that uh, renewable natural gas, again, we're going to get into the definition later, but but renewable natural gas may actually be a little better in some of these uh, cases than electricity. You want to take that? Sure. So, um, you know, there's going to be a different solution for a lot of different applications, but in the ports, um, uh, Long Beach in LA, um, you know, you have around 18,000 Class 8 trucks that are operating in, in that in a space on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and one of the challenges that you have is, um, is deploying a brand new type of, of equipment and those bridge applications would typically use 10 or 15 year old trucks. So from a cost standpoint, it's very difficult for them to make it work. And it will be for any technology for that matter. So it's going to be very expensive to move, um, drainage operations from current technology or older technology to brand new technology. It's going to be very expensive to do that. Renewable natural gas is going to um, give you the best uh, operation. So on a, on a battery electric vehicle, you've got to be limited to how long you can keep a charge in the vehicle. Renewable natural gas can continue to operate as long as you get fuel in the tanks. So you're not limited operationally at all by renewable natural gas, whereas you're going to have some challenges around um, the battery electric vehicles in that market segment. Yeah, so the range question that, that you talk about, but but in some ways, one of the things that you've described as being the, the, the sweet spot, if you will, for renewable natural gas and for natural gas in general is repeatable routes, uh, things where you know you're going back to the base to charge, or dare I say, refill uh, in the case of uh, RNG. Um, but, but really, it, there is sort of the newer equipment question. I mean, these, these trucks from a cost of acquisition perspective, electric trucks are very expensive. You're saying, wait a minute, a drop in fuel like RNG, again, we'll get to the definition in a moment, uh, is something that, you know, you could do it right now. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the fleets are doing this today. So it's new first fit, buy the truck, um, you know, figure out what your operations are going to be um, and uh, where you're going to refuel. But, and as I said earlier, uh, most of the operations now are behind the fence. They're privately refueling on, on their own property. It would normally anyways if they're running diesels. So it's just it's just a matter of changing the fuel over, and then from an operational standpoint, uh, the maintenance is very similar, uh, and from an operator standpoint, uh, it's virtually the same. Refueling time is about the same on uh, natural gas versus uh, diesel. So you know, from an operational impact, it is the least disruptive of all the technologies that are being offered out there. Alternative technologies uh, that are zero or net sub-zero emissions. Okay, before we go on, let's get some definitions out of the way. Let's talk about natural gas, which is technically a fossil fuel because it, it is pulled off of diesel, or off of oil. It's an oil burning technology or oil burning fuel. Renewable natural gas is not. Can you give us a good layman's understanding of what that is? Sure. Uh, so natural gas generally is, is considered to be a byproduct of uh, drilling an oil well. So it's a fossil fuel. And that's one of the distinctions you have to look at. Whereas renewable natural gas is not a fossil fuel. 
it comes from uh, organic. It'd be an anaerobic digester and a, um, uh, on, on a cow farm or a dairy farm, or it could be from landfills. So you've got over 2,000 landfills in the United States that are operational. Uh, several thousand are out of operation. Every one of these landfills creates every day millions of gallons of, of uh, uh, renewable natural gas. You just draw it off those landfills and you, know, you clean it and uh, press it and put it into the, the grid. And that's how the system works. So if you're an operator, you go to a fuel broker who will give you access to renewable natural gas credits. That's what you're paying for. And so that's what you're operating in your vehicles is renewable natural gas. You can physically do this. Uh, in California, it requires that. Or the fact that you're buying renewable natural gas uh, and you're putting that renewable natural gas into the grid, um, that displaces a fossil fuel natural gas. So there lies where you get the credits, um, in addition to being very, very clean on engine emissions by itself. Help me understand how renewable natural gas gets to the grid. I, I want to understand that. I'm not sure I do. Yeah, so renewable natural gas is drawn off from a variety of different sources. Unlike um, um, diesel fuel or liquid fuel pipelines in the United States, there's about three, a little over 3 million miles of natural gas pipelines or pipelines in the United States. The grid is very extensive. So that's how you access this fuel. Most all of the properties are in these large communities are already plumbed with gas and pipelines. You just bring in the pipelines into those facilities whether you're heating or, or uh, heating your facilities off gas or refueling your vehicles with gas, it's the same pipeline. So, so basically, you're able to run the RNG as a fuel in the same line as you would natural gas. Is yeah. That so, if yeah. you're running uh, straight, if you look at the amount of natural gas that's in the grid, the question really is: is how much can you displace that fossil natural gas? How much can you replace that with renewable natural gas? Right. That's the cleaner fuel. And you, that's the point. You're displacing fossil with renewable natural gas. That's where you get the credit. And, and where do you see that? I'm sure you've modeled this. Where you've indicated to me privately that there's really no limits on this in terms of making natural gas. Uh, but but where where is the current uh, substitution and where's where could it go? Well, right now, uh, Anybody that wants renewable natural gas for their vehicles are not having any problem at all getting fuel. That's number one. Access to renewable natural gas is global. Um, it again literally is off of uh, any landfills. We were in a project in, in the Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. They plumbed their landfill. The refuse uh, groups over there are going to be running renewable natural gas in, in Ho Chi Minh City. It, it's literally you can take it anywhere. And again, it is um, uh, very accessible. And um, it is it's the cleanest fuel out there. So uh, you don't have to become dependent upon a unique fuel per se. It is, it is home-based. Okay. Politics is probably not a big part of what you do, but I have to ask a political question. California, again, they tend to lead in a lot of these areas. California says, uh, we're in love with electricity. All we want are battery electric vehicles. Don't really talk to us about anything else. How do you make the case, even though California has said, you know, it could do 20 percent or 100 percent of its trucks on renewable natural gas? Not interested. Give me electricity. How do you make the case for RNG? Well, um, I think that the RNG uh, case is uh, pretty self-evident for a lot of companies. And given the option, again, some of the sort of things that you're trying to do is to deploy a technology that works well with your company and your company's logistics. Calling out a specific technology um, and, and, and selecting that as being the primary um, source of goods movement, is, I think it's, it's, a, it's a troubled road to get out. If you go to the industry, in my view is, if you go to the industry and you set the objectives where you want to be on emissions and allow the technologies come to market that become commercially viable in addition to environmentally viable those are the two criteria you're going to mention from and right now there is a push for uh, going towards whether it's hydrogen or electric vehicles battery electric vehicles good technologies companies all invested in that 
But the question is, is what is what is deployable when? And is there a path to those technologies through natural gas or re through renewable natural gas? We believe there is uh, for many applications, certainly in the goods movement uh, space as well. So as far as the uh, the drawbacks, if you will, the dirty grid argument that you hear and that electric vehicles aren't, aren't so zero emission if you go all the way back up to the grid and find that it's, say, a coal-fired grid or, you know, and I realize that's not always the case. But uh, you're saying that essentially not only is the renewable natural gas here now, but you don't have any of those penalties. Everything's kind of known up front in terms That's of where right. it comes from. Yeah. Let me ask you one more definition question, Hugh, and that is the question of negative net zero. I wrote the a couple of weeks ago, I did what we call an ask waves here at Freight Waves to try to describe it. And I said in my lead, I said, it sounds oxymoronic. It sounds like it cancels itself out, um, or it's uh, something just a strange phrase. Walk us through what makes something negative net zero carbon. So if you look at full life cycle, that is the point of all the alternatives. You need to do an assessment of, of you know, start to finish uh, what you're consuming to have the output of the technology. In our case, um, net, sub-zero emissions is uh, the result of, for example, going to a landfill that would normally just maybe be capped. And then they vent off the landfills. You're still percolating methane every day. That is what is known as a sort of a fugitive um, uh, pollutant, if you will. And, and in this case, we can convert that methane that would normally emit to the atmosphere into a consumable fuel. And so therein lies the opportunity to get that that net sub zero. It's a net sub zero because it's the cleanest fuel out there. And uh, again, with our engines, your emissions are, you, with a credit from renewable natural gas, with our engines, gives you a net sub zero emissions. Otherwise, fuel being that would have gone into the atmosphere. Yeah. So instead, you're, 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 you're basically substituting that which would have been in the air, you're now putting it in the tank. Right. Basically. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Okay, well, I think I think it's understandable when you put it in in that language. Um, do you see sort of any upper limits for this? I mean, you, you know, your your natural gas and and correct me if you disagree, is a bit of a bit player right now. It's got its niche, and that's really the way it's probably best described. What brings it into prime time? Well, I think what's going to bring it into prime time is, again, it's the commercial discussion. So there are a lot of technologies out there and, and there's no one fuel that is going to dominate in the future like diesel has in the past. So there are going to be a variety of different technologies that are going to be, um, you know, worthwhile for some fleets to adopt or not. And again, it really depends on, on what your uh, liabilities are and your source of liabilities. But in the goods movement space, Renewable natural gas uh, can cover uh, all of those um, uh, operations that move your goods to the final market. It's a huge liability for a lot of companies. Uh, what their fuel consumption is and um, how that is going to impact carbon tax. Eventually, that will be a factor in this country. That's what will continue to accelerate the adoption of renewable natural gas operations is a carbon tax, which is uh, frequently being asked about more and more in Washington these days, and I fully believe, you know, we're one of the last countries uh, on the planet who is not working somehow around a carbon tax. That's what's going to be a prime motivator for people to start adopting this technology. Okay, the kind of the uh, the stick, not the carrot. All right, so so let me ask you one more thing. We're running out of time here, but I want to ask you one more thing. There, there's a company out there that is using or wants to use renewable natural gas to make electricity on a truck. It sounds like an elegant, if not a little complicated solution. Um, you suggested that maybe there's something else coming that might bring that into question. Well, I, you know, uh, there are some technologies out there that are that are continue to, you know, break new barriers and in, in, in terms of cost and, and delivery and, and all good stuff. Um, and there's an awful lot of BW mitigation funds that are dedicated to developing all of these technologies. And, and I think that's part of what I was speaking to earlier about is um, there's going to be a lot of different technologies that fit into some applications better than others. 
in terms of, of you know, where we are, uh, Cummins, um, you know, uh, published a, uh, a notice here last fall that they are releasing a 15 liter natural gas engine uh, in China. Uh, China is a huge opportunity for Cummins. It's uh, always been a, um, a, um, um, a strong supporter of uh, products there. Uh, we have factories there. We have had a presence, I think, going back to the Nixon era. So um, we think that there's a good opportunity in China to operate a 15 liter natural gas engine. And I think that uh, is not terribly complicated. And uh, for that reason, um, in a 15 liter engine that has an operating range of uh, 400 horsepower, 1650 torque to 530, 1850 torque, uh, covers an awful lot of applications that may in fact, um, uh, get exceed over 80,000 pounds of GBW in China. And then the question is, is what happens in North America? Is that something we should release here? Um, certainly that's, um, being discussed. I don't, don't, don't make that decision myself. But uh, for the people who do, uh, it's an option for them. If there's enough demand for it, I'm, I'm uh, sure that's what they're thinking. Sure. Well, listen, Hugh, this has been fascinating. I've enjoyed it. Um, it helped me learn a little bit more, get a little more firm on some of the concepts around uh, renewable natural gas, negative net zero carbon. Thank you very much for being part of the Net Zero Carbon Summit. My pleasure, Alan. Thank you very much.